Welcome to a discussion series on free trade and liberalization as part of the 1991 project at the Mercator Center. I'm Shruti Rajagopalan, and in this conversation, I'm going to be talking trade with Arvind Panagarya, who is a professor of economics and the Jagdish Bhagwati professor of Indian political economy at Columbia University. In the past, Arvind has served as the first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog for the Government of India and as a chief economist of the Asian Development Bank. He is the author of a number of books, but today's conversation in particular will focus on his recent 2019 book, Free Trade and Prosperity, published by the Oxford University Press. Welcome, Arvind. It's a pleasure to have you here. Shruti, pleasure as always. Arvind, you serve as the director of the Deepak and Neera Raj Center on Indian Economic Policies at Columbia University. The center's mission is to promote economic prosperity in India by improving the understanding of the Indian economy through research and by sustaining ongoing dialogues on major policy issues. Here we have a shared interest, as you know, the 1991 project at the Mercatus Center commemorates the liberalization of the Indian economy and its consequences on its 30th anniversary. Our main goal is to revive the discourse on economic growth and the reforms that are centered around economic ideas in India. This series on trade is a joint effort by Mercatus's 1991 project and Columbia's Deepak Anira Raj Center. Arvind, thank you for sharing your insights based on decades of research on trade. But before we talk about the reforms in India in future episodes, I want to start at a more fundamental point, which is the relationship between liberal trade policies and economic development and well-being in society. Now, this is a theme that you have explored in a bulk of your academic research and writing throughout your career. More specifically, in this book, you have argued that sustained growth and prosperity almost always require low or declining trade barriers. What is the relationship between free trade and economic growth? And what is the mechanism by which lowering trade barriers leads to more economic growth in developing countries? Good. (laughs) Very broad question, Shruti. So uh, 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 probably the answer is going to be a bit long, uh, uh, but uh, uh, let me begin. Uh, so, So this really goes to the heart of the entire field of international trade. Uh, and and uh, 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 there are a number of ways to to answer the question, and and each of them gives you some uh, aspect of why trade uh, matters so much. Uh, now you know in the classroom settings, of course, we uh, begin with the principle of comparative advantage, uh, uh, and and that's that simply tells you that look, you know, you should specialize in uh, what you are best at. Uh, and 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 uh, uh, it doesn't matter e- even if you are uh, not you know good at uh, uh, any one of the tasks but but still as long as you know you specialize in the tasks within your your abilities uh, uh, the one that you do the best uh, go for it. Uh, it it's sort of you know like in in a hospital for example you got many different doctors there are uh, neurosurgeons neurologists the uh, uh, pediatricians and uh, then there are physicians and then there are uh, nurses etc uh, and and it's possible that the neurosurgeon is both uh, a, a, a top class neurosurgeon and but also a top class physician uh, but would we say that this neurosurgeon should also therefore do some duties of the physician? Uh, and normally we'll say no, because there are other physicians who can't do what neurosurgeon can do, but uh, uh, they can do the job of the physician. So the neurosurgeon, even if he is a better physician than all the other physicians in the hospital, ought to really specialize in neurosurgery. Uh, and it's the same kind of principle that applies to countries that look, you know, uh, 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 do what you do the best and specialize in it, and and then you export uh, uh, in in return for what uh, 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 other countries are better than you at. So that's a fundamental kind of principle of comparative advantage. That's the starting point. Uh, But but now, you know, we can go to other aspects, why specialization actually is beneficial. And and one of the very important reasons, of course, that we also now teach in our international trade classes is the economies of scale that you know 
uh, fine, there is one reason, which is this, what we call the comparative advantage, where I should also point out actually that, look, you know, uh, uh, if, if a, a country like China or India has a lot of abundance of labor, then it will actually produce more cheaply the products that use labor more intensively uh, relative to capital, let's say. And, and countries like the United States, European Union, et cetera, which have a lot more capital relative to labor, they are labor scarce countries, uh, they can produce more cheaply the capital intensive products and export those. So this is all a part of the principle of comparative advantage where uh, a specialization is driven by the differences in the comparative costs. Now economies of scale is the second source, very important one. Uh, and, and there again, we see, you know, particularly if you look at the success of countries like China, uh, scale has been one of uh, uh, the very important keys. Uh, right? You know, when, when you produce a billion iPhones, uh, your costs are going to be a lot lower than a country that's producing, let's say, only, you know, a, a, a few million uh, because uh, you're able to actually spread your fixed cost of production. Uh, uh, even more dramatic example is the aircraft industry. Right? You know, the first aircraft takes the, it is very costly because you have to set up the entire machinery and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, once you have set up the machinery, second aircraft becomes much cheaper, third becomes even cheaper, and so forth. So again, that's the economies of scale. But in practice, there are other reasons, you know, why uh, 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 specialization in trade and, and particularly. Uh, being a part of the global economy turns out to be so important. We said, you know, you, your question was, was posed in terms of trade liberalization. It's really meaning, you know, don't just operate on your home turf. Go out to the global markets, compete there. Uh, it's, it's really like, you know, if you want to draw an analogy from sports, uh, if, you, if you're playing cricket and, and you really are playing cricket only within your home state uh, and not even national, you're not going to produce a whole lot of uh, 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 world-class players like Tendulkar and uh, Kohli and so forth. Because you're competing against the best, you learn from them, they learn from you. And you know when the best uh, uh, in the world go against each other, they have to figure out all kinds of strategies. And entrepreneurship is, is something very similar as well, that you know, when, when you in the global marketplace, you go and play against one another, uh, each of you is the best in your field, uh, you learn from each other. So, so that sort of is yet another reason why openness to trade, trade liberalization helps. Um, then uh, uh, again, uh, uh, technology is another very important reason why openness matters, you know, technological diffusion, innovation can happen in one country, uh, but in the end that innovation can become available through either patents or ultimately, you know, diffusion of technology, uh, reverse engineering of products and so forth. Uh, that's another source of uh, gains from trade. Uh, you know, again, if we go back to the Indian history, uh, we know that we lost out so badly simply because, you know, we didn't even allow even the products to come into our country. Uh, uh, and, and so we didn't have, have any idea in those days that the quality of the product was so much superior in other parts of the world than, than it was in India. So again, that sort of, you know, uh, uh, once we opened up in 1991, we began to see the big, big difference, you know, the, and, and that, of course, forces you to either through reverse engineering or through whatever, you know, you say, well, this is the best, you know, the customer also forces you. When the when, when customer goes for the you know what is available from abroad a better quality at a lower price, yeah. um, then of course you know uh, the domestic producers are forced to shape up as well. So so that uh, as well the technological diffusion and and all. And I think I would say one last reason why this helps uh, is also uh, the, the 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 fact that uh, when you uh, uh, open up. And, and let me just take the case, extreme case. When you're free trade, you're benchmarking your own domestic producers to the best in the world, right? And, and, and then you say that, look, you know, compete against those. Right? And, and for the government, that also is a challenge that if they really commit to that, then they can come back and ask, you know, why are my manufacturers, producers in certain sectors are not able to compete? Something is maybe fundamentally wrong with my policies. 
So you then begin to fix the domestic policies. But if you take the opposite approach, where you say that, oh, you know, you, you, there, there are a lot of domestic policy problems, you don't actually reform those policies. And then the manufacturers come in and say that, look, you know, I got this disability, there's 10% disability because of high electricity prices, another 10% because my labor laws are so inflexible and all. Uh, so I've got about almost 25% uh, disability relative to the foreign uh, suppliers. And I come and say that, okay, I'll give you 25% tariff protection. Well, I've not solved the fundamental problem. Uh, I, I have, and what I've done is to allow my high cost producers to continue to produce. Yeah. Uh, that's the wrong thing to do. So I think even for policy reform, commitment to free trade or something very close to free trade forces reform in the domestic policies that are an obstacle. So these are some of the four or five very important reasons why you know, free trade actually uh, uh, does help growth. And then of course we can come uh, as, as we go forward to, to you know, the, the link between, uh, uh, at least the empirical link between uh, openness and growth as well as empirical link between openness uh, and poverty. I would actually add one more aspect that I've actually learned from you and your work, uh, if you permit me, which is that once we open up globally to free trade, all the inputs also become cheaper. Uh, without tariffs and protectionism, which means that everything that is being produced, whether it is for the global economy or the domestic economy, uh, automatically, without any change in technology, without any additional changes in global uh, productivity, you can still produce everything cheaper uh, because now you have access to the cheapest and best inputs from abroad, uh, which is going to make you know your domestic and global output better. And sometimes uh, cheaper inputs may just give you larger margins. And sometimes they may help you compete better by competing better on price globally. So that I think is one more important effect of uh, opening up to free trade. Absolutely. I think you know, it's a very good point. I missed out. But you know, technology is not the only thing, but also the inputs themselves. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. And uh, 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 you know, we got fantastic examples from India. Uh, you know, you go back to 50s and 60s. Uh, we won't allow, uh, for example, the clothing manufacturers to produce to, to, to import fabric. And the fabric we produced domestically was not world class. And so when you use that fabric to manufacture clothing, you can't export that yeah. because the uh, because the global uh, customer comes in and says that this cloth is just not to, 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 to the, my, my kind of taste or to my kind of quality. Uh, and so, you know, even on the export side, you are not, not able to compete. So it's not, I mean, they're both factors, not just the input prices, but also the quality of the input. Quality. Similarly, you know, we, a lot of the machinery, because of uh, India's uh, initial emphasis on heavy industry, right? A lot of machinery began to be produced domestically. But uh, you know this machinery was not uh, uh, to the quality uh, of the uh, and so not only it was more expensive, but it was also not the, the, the world class quality. And so then you know if machines are substandard, then the products that you produce with them also can't compete. So absolutely, I think very very important as well because technology, after all, is also embedded uh, uh, or embodied in in uh, in, in, in machines. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I am obviously very persuaded by your arguments that free trade leads to rapid economic growth, and not just by the arguments, but also uh, some of the evidence that I have seen. Uh, but there are often skeptics uh, and those who are persuaded that free trade may increase the size of the market, may lead to economic growth, uh, but they are not persuaded that it actually benefits the poor in developing countries, right? So first, can you tell us the link or the, rather the broad empirical evidence that connects free trade to economic growth and then whether actually it reduces poverty uh, in developing countries? What has the track record been globally, say, you know, in the last 50 or 100 years? Okay, so so let's first, you know, I mean, ultimately the, the link of uh, 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 openness to poverty uh, principally is through growth. Uh, 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 one can draw, uh, uh, at least conceptually, some link uh, more directly from openness to poverty. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, but uh, and and will you know perhaps come and and, and discuss that as well. But uh, uh, I want to start first with growth because I think this is where the big impact on poverty uh, uh, comes uh, from openness. Uh, if if you can really engineer faster growth, uh, um, uh, uh, growth you know in the range of eight nine percent a year, as as some of the most successful countries were able to do. Uh, and then uh, there is no way poor are left behind, and we'll you know we can come to evidence as well you know that that uh, uh, to, to 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 be sure that uh, what I'm saying actually is supported by the by the data themselves. Uh, but let's let's get to the the evidence you know now now of course conceptually all of, all the factors that we have discussed we have talked about just now. Uh, uh, the the specialization, economies of scale, uh, uh, technological diffusion, availability of inputs, uh, uh, the the technology that is embodied in machinery, um, uh, uh, all sorts of factors uh, uh, are there which can, in principle, contribute to faster growth. Uh, and and uh, uh, of course, theory on this is is, is a little more ambivalent, uh, uh, you know, depending on how you write your model. Uh, 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 there are all these endogenous growth models that one could look at, but but in the end, they don't provide you enough guidance in the sense that, you know, depending on how you write the model, you could uh, 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 show trade to be uh, uh, leading to faster or slower growth. So, so then you have to choose which model and so forth, uh, which is why I think the empirical evidence here becomes, becomes most critical. So let me just say that you know we can look at the empirical evidence and let's do that systematically uh, uh, at, at uh, two or three different levels. Uh, I mean, this is a very vast subject among economists, trade economists, especially among trade economists. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there are at least three levels at which we can uh, uh, look at it. Uh, one, one is at the very aggregate level, uh, you know, how uh, uh, it, it, over the years, if we look particularly at the developing countries, uh, starting you know in, in the post-independence era largely, um, uh, uh, how the uh, economies, uh, developing eco country economies, have performed uh, uh, you know, during various periods. Uh, the second, we can look at you know uh, this this issue of causation uh, because there uh, a lot of the skeptics. Uh, uh, come in and say that, look, you know, fine, you see this correlation or association between faster growth and faster growth in trade. Uh, but uh, how do you know that causation is going from growth to trade or from trade to growth? So, so there is also a good bit of literature on, on um, uh, causation, uh, whether actually the uh, faster growth in trade leads to faster growth in the per capita incomes and so forth. So, so we can come to that. And third is the you know is is what I find most persuasive personally. I would say, which is the 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 country uh, cross uh, you know the the country case studies. Uh, uh, so we we can look at uh, countries that have grown uh, uh, very rapidly over certain periods of time uh, and try to see. Uh, whether uh, uh, that uh, uh, is being that growth is being driven by policies that uh, largely rely on uh, open markets, I should say from the beginning here that you know uh, trade uh, uh, is uh, one of the things which is very important for faster growth. Uh, 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 there can certainly be you know factors that could uh, uh, prevent that that uh, benefit of. Uh, of openness uh, uh, leading to faster growth, uh, uh, failing to realize. Uh, it's very simple, you know, that you can have free trade policy, but if uh, your uh, transportation links to ports uh, are not good, uh, if your infrastructure is awful, uh, then even if you opened up yourself in terms of the policies, you're not going to get there because uh, the, 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 the tr no trade uh, response would happen. Uh, uh, likewise, uh, if the rest of the world is closed, you are open, uh, well, it still is not going to have much impact because the rest of the world is not trading. So, 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 th so there are factors and then you can extend it to some of the domestic policies. Uh, if domestic policies are incredibly constraining, like India had all this license uh, 
uh, investment licensing, uh, 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 the, all sorts of uh, rigidities in the labor markets, rigidities in the land markets, what uh, not. Uh, then also, you know, you, you, uh, the, the impact of the policies will not be realized. So, so uh, I'm perfectly aware that you know uh, uh, that that, that uh, the the lack of uh, flexibility in many of the other policies can 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 uh, 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 negate basically the benefits that could otherwise accrue from uh, trade. But but the point here is that look, you know, so trade by itself is not sufficient, but it is what it is perhaps the most important necessary condition. Uh, and it uh, always in, in 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 designing your policy reforms, it is a very good starting point. Uh, uh, you know, once you begin to open and feel committed to opening the economy to trade, uh, you are also going to do other policy reforms uh, uh, systematically, uh, so forth. So, so with that, you know, dealt with. Uh, uh, let let me. Now get to the to the to the evidence, right? You know that yeah. that in in broad terms, uh, does the evidence really support uh, the the uh, link uh, between openness and growth? Now some of the early work that came out, you know, particularly from Danny Rodrick. So first, you know, uh, he did this short book in 1999 where he argued that look, you know, if I look at the data, uh, then uh, uh, the the uh, Period uh, uh, that that in during which the developing countries do the best uh, 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 is the one prior uh, you know prior to the uh, oil crisis uh, and so you know it takes about 1961 because the data really are available uh, starting from 1961 on a consistent basis for uh, a large number of developing countries. So it takes those data, says, you know, 1961 to, I think, 73 or 74, uh, and finds that, you know, uh, uh, during that period, the on, on in aggregate, the growth rate for the developing countries uh, what was higher than the subsequent periods. So, so you can take almost, you know, take, take, take it from uh, 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 1974 or 75 to 1995 or so, because he's writing in 1999. And it turns out to be true that, you know, 61 to 73 or 74, uh, the GDP growth rate of the developing countries is higher. Uh, and, and so therefore he concludes that, that uh, uh, really the golden period of growth um, uh, uh, for the developing countries was when they were actually pursuing import substitution. Now, you know, broadly speaking, uh, that observation is also perhaps correct that, you know, broadly speaking, uh, that was a period during which uh, uh, the developing countries, uh, as an aggregate, if you take it, were, were more into import substitution. Um, uh, now, what uh, uh, then, then later, actually, same sentiment is is then uh, uh, expressed uh, uh, very much uh, echoed by uh, Hajun Chang, uh, who, who is another relatively influential kind of uh, free trade critic. Um, uh, but but Hajun Chang was already writing in two thousand seven, by which time the evidence had changed. Uh, <laughs> but uh, either he did not do the figures right himself, you know, or or relied on old uh, uh, evidence. Uh, so he, he has no excuse actually to to uh, uh, to to to, to uh, missing out the data being factually incorrect uh, because I've done the data. Uh, what happens is that it is true that initially sixty one to seventy three or seventy four uh, the, the developing countries do grow better, but then the oil crisis hits and all sorts of bad things happen, and then there is also this. Uh, 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 liberalization that is largely kind of driven by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, there is a debt crisis that happens in the 1980s, uh, and uh, that sort of you know leads Latin American countries, uh, uh, the, the African countries, into debt traps, and and that gives the International Monetary Fund a lot of clout, and so they really go in and 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 largely you can say there was some bit of forced liberalization. Uh, in that liberalization in the end, you know, at that time at least was not so much owned by the countries themselves. And then, of course, that what that also means is that, you know, a lot of the other complementary reforms that ought to happen uh, probably didn't happen at the time. And so that period 
does and then even the generally the global economy doesn't do that well during this period so developing countries did do poorly but of course you know the impact of this this drive by the imf and the world bank partially of course but also there was diffusion of ideas of trade economists uh, uh, that was beginning to happen right you know in the 1970s uh, uh, some major uh, research projects projects had been done one by the oecd another by nber uh, a third by the world bank so all these research projects were were diffusing the ideas of these uh, uh, ideas as well as evidence from these projects and and that sort of led to uh, the gradual acceptance actually on the part of the, many of the developing countries and they began to own this process of liberalization so, we know of course india was a big example 91 but china before that had started already uh, but a uh, uh, lot of the latin american countries also came on board uh, countries in africa came on board uh, and then lo and behold you begin to see the, the evidence completely turned around so uh, 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 i've done the numbers and and i'll give you some some numbers you know uh, 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 so i've taken the 1961 to 2013 uh, which is a fairly large period and i divide it into three different periods now you can divide it any which way you know these are about, about close to five decades of data uh, and you can whichever way you want to divide it it doesn't matter you know the evidence is so strong that once this liberalization took root and countries began to own it uh, uh growth rate is significantly higher actually in the in in, in the uh, uh, mid 1990s onwards period so 61 to 75 in 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 my taking is about 3.1% for the developing countries then 76 to 94 it does drop to 2.4 so this was the period you know the world bank pushing it out and and uh, 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 the the entire soviet union breaking down and the eastern european countries uh, uh, turning uh, from uh, from uh, uh, out inward policies to outward policies but you know this is the transition period so it is did drop to 2.4% but 95 to 2013 4% Uh, uh which is significantly higher than the 3.1% that had been achieved in 61 to 1961 to 75 so that's the one basic point you know so you can change you can you know uh, slice these data whichever you want i do it even by decades so by decades if you do 61 to 70 1960s decade growth was 2.9% 71 to 1980 was 3.3% but then you come to the later decades and you have 2001 to 2010 4.7%. So it was really significantly you know almost hitting 5% for, uh, as an aggregate for the developing countries quite unprecedented. Not only that actually it also turns out it also turns out that you know during the early decades when growth was happening uh, the early 60s and early 70 I mean 60s 1960s and early 1970s uh, OECD countries were growing very rapidly they grew much more rapidly uh, so uh, if you want to take the period 1961 to 75 oecd countries are growing at 3.5% so they are providing the the kind of impetus they they are serving as the engine of growth for the uh, developing countries as well but if you take the third period 1995 to 2013 when the developing countries are growing 4.0% uh, 4% compared to 3.1% in the first period from 61 to 75 uh, uh oecd countries are growing during this period from 95 to 2013 only 1.4% so you know the uh, it is the liberalization by the countries themselves that is making all the difference so so it's it's clearly their liberalization you know not not the rapid growth of uh, uh, oecd countries uh, uh, oecd countries are you know sometimes people say that oh today the economic environment uh, uh, is 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 not good enough you know, the global economy is not growing and therefore uh, uh, trade cannot be the engine of growth and all but hey you know china the whole, all developing countries taken as a group you know 95 to 2013 oecd countries are growing only 1.4% but because they had their own policies which were much more outward oriented uh, and uh, admittedly some of the other uh, uh, complementary policies in place as well they grew at 4%, 4%. now one last point here which is also important to to bring in is that even for the period 61 to 75 right you know even if one were to say that this was a good period for the developing countries which countries are driving that growth Yes. you got korea you got taiwan you got singapore hong kong so, you know some of the most open economies are the ones 
that during this period actually grew so rapidly, uh, uh, something like 8% to 10%, yeah. even in that period. But, you know, if you read Roderick or Hajun Chang, you'll see no references, you know, uh, references to Korea go elsewhere, you know, but, but not in this context. But, but in the end, you know, this is what mattered. No, I think the last point you said really is important. And I know that's one of the reasons both you and I think, uh, you know, specific country studies become very, very important in this context. But the 3.1% and the 4% in later decades that you point out, that's an aggregate across all countries which are put in the bucket of developing countries. But it doesn't tell you very much about which are the countries which are growing fast, which are the countries growing slowly, and which are the countries which are in negative rates of growth, which also happen in certain years for certain countries. So when you look from 61 to 75, India is in the, you know, what is pejoratively dubbed as the Hindu rate of growth, right? And it's the same years when India becomes more and more inward, you know, the the first attempt at devaluation fails in 1966, you know, Mrs. Gandhi takes a turn to be even more socialist and inward looking, Uh, that that is exactly the period when we see the emergence of what we call the Asian tigers, right? You have South Korea leading leading the group and you have Singapore, you have Hong Kong, you have uh, Taiwan, and then of course, followed by China, which is a different scale in terms of, uh, you know, the size of the economy. Uh, but, but the 3.1% and the 4% masks this difference even within developing countries. There is a separation even within that pool. Yes. Yes. No, no, absolutely. 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 Right. So, uh, 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 and, and, and uh, 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 there is a point that you have to disaggregate. You have yes. to disaggregate. In fact, I mean, you know, I've written on this and there is a, uh, uh, this is reported in the, uh, in, in, in the relevant chapter in my book as well, that, you know, what I did actually for, for each of these periods, uh, I, I separated the countries. And 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 uh, this is it. Uh, 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 earliest, the first thing I wrote was a paper which was titled, uh, you know, miracles and debacles. Uh, 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 and and, and the, so so what I said was any country that grows on on a sustained basis, which I you know could be about one and a half decades, let's say, uh, in per capita terms at three percent. Uh, let's call that miracle uh, uh, growth. Uh, uh, you know, it's arbitrary, but you can you know yeah. choose another threshold, three and a half, or you can choose two and a half, whatever. You, uh, the the basic thrust of the argument doesn't change. And and then I call debacles countries, you know, which uh, uh, in per capita in some terms either don't grow or grow at negative rates. So they they actually per capita income declines. Uh, and and uh, I, I look at both because there is also this complaint that uh, of free trade causes decimation. You know, countries. Uh, Suddenly, the industry, uh, domestic industry, is destroyed by free trade, and, and so it leads to this very like negative kind of growth. So you look at the debacles also that you know is trade behind that kind of debacle. So I basically try to look at at least the association, and when you do that, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, countries that uh, are growing at three percent or more in per capita terms, uh, they overwhelmingly actually are also uh, experiencing at that time. Uh, rising trade to GDP ratio, rising exports to GDP ratio. Uh, uh, so, and, and you know, because what that means is that the GDP is uh, per capita GDP is growing three percent, and if population is growing another one to two percent, then the GDP is growing at four to five percent. And even then, when you say exports to GDP ratio is rising, yeah. that of course means that you know your 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 trade is rising even faster than 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 the GDP. So, so that's sort of, you know, that's the miracles part of the story. Debacles part of the story turns out that, you know, you almost rarely find that uh, the negative growth is correlated with uh, 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 fast uh, 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 surges of imports. You, you just don't see imports growing, you know, uh, uh, at, at any fast pace during the period when countries do very poorly uh, in per capita terms. I'm going to ask you to elaborate more on per capita income and the relationship with economic growth. But before that, you know, for the listeners, especially sometimes it seems like, oh, 1%, 2%, they seem like such small numbers. But we're talking about rates of growth. And when you start compounding, the impact is really, really large. So, you know, there are different estimates in different countries, but very, very rough rule of thumb estimate for India is that an increase in 1% of GDP per capita growth uh, leads to an additional 3 million people getting lifted out of poverty, right? So if you're talking an additional 3% 
per capita growth, you're talking about nine to 10 million people being lifted out of poverty. And now when you see that over, say, 15 years or 30 years, you're basically eliminating the, the extreme poverty in a country uh, in a relatively short period of time in global history, right? 15 years, 20 years is a very short time in global history to actually eliminate the poverty problem. So on the face of it, it seems like 1% here, 2% here. It seems like you're haggling over such small numbers, but the impact on real lives of the poor is quite extraordinary. Uh, so I'm going to request you, can you take us through the link between this kind of, you know, the nexus between free trade economic growth now translating to improvements in per capita GDP? Um, okay, so so we can look at the data. So we, we got some data here. Um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, um, give you some. Um, uh, so so we, we can look at this. Uh, World Bank actually has uh, compiled most of these data. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so, so do some dramatic comparison here. Let's do some dramatic comparison. So unfortunately, we don't have the 1950s data. I mean, at least the World Bank on a consistent basis uh, doesn't give the data for the 1950s. Uh, although we know from other sources, uh, uh, not the World Bank, but other sources where the scholars have tried to estimate the GDP the per, ca per capita incomes in the 1950s. You know, you look at India, you look at China, you look at South Korea, uh, those three roughly start at about the same place in the same place in around uh, early 1950s. Yeah. And actually, you know, there's at least for South Korea, there's also a period of uh, uh, civil war, actually, you know, not civil war, but the, the South Korea, North Korea war, which had decimated it. And in 1954, it probably started below where India was uh, yeah. uh, uh, because of the devastation of the war. Uh, uh, not, uh, some of the other countries which did better uh, did well also uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Taiwan uh, they had probably started uh, they were probably a little bit higher but by 1961 uh, th this is what uh, it, it looks like um, so, so I'll give you the numbers uh, 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 this is uh, uh, in real terms so it's in 2010 constant US dollars China's per capita income was $141 um, India was actually significantly more, according to the World Bank numbers, uh, $336. Uh, and uh, 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 South Korea uh, is, is uh, uh, about three times of India at that time, $968. So South Korea is about, uh, you can say $1,000, a little, little less than that. Uh, China about $140. 141 to be precise, and India 336. So India is in the middle. Come to let's say year 2000. Right? You come to 2000. Um, India gets to about 827. China has now surpassed India by a good margin. It's almost twice of India, uh, $1,768, uh, and of course South Korea is is on a different scale by now. Uh, 15,400. Uh, so 15,400, 827, and uh, 1768 for China. So India is 827, China is 1768, uh, uh, South Korea is 15,414. <laughs> Come to 2019, this is sort of roughly the current period. Now, where do we stand today? Today, so 19, 2019, China is 8,242 per capita income. India is one fourth of that, 2,152, and uh, uh, South Korea is about 28,676. You can see, you know, this totally. Now, also very interestingly, uh, this we, we can look at the numbers later, but uh, uh, it turns out that in South Korea and uh, China both, and then you can look at Taiwan, Singapore as well. Um, Poverty got eliminated pretty much uh, by, by this kind of uh, phenomenal growth they experienced. Uh, and it got eliminated by growth itself. You know, they hardly had any so, uh, uh, social uh, uh, um, programs uh, in the way India has actually at a very low level of income started these social expenditure programs like the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme or uh, the 
public distribution system of food and so forth, you know, uh, these countries really ran none of that actually in, in, on any significant scale whatsoever. You, they may, you may find a tiny programs here and there, but, but nothing significant. Um, much of the poverty actually reduction happened purely by, by growth. Uh, and, and you'll see, you know, when we look at uh, South Korea, particularly as, as, as a country case study, uh, we'll, we'll find that that is uh, that indeed the case. You know, I just wanted to take uh, just briefly mention that this whole issue about causation, whether you know it, it is trade causing growth and growth causing trade. So now you know economists have actually looked at this, and the, you know. So let me explain that, and then we can come to the discussion of uh, uh, South Korea. I think that's where a lot of the good uh, um, you know country case study gives you a lot more feel for what is happening. Uh, and, and so, but on causation now, you know, what, what economists have done uh, is to, at least the earlier studies that were done, uh, this is a, a study by Jeff Frankel and, and his co-authors, uh, and, and what they did was they, they used the gravity model. You know, what the gravity model does is it, it, it shows that, look, you know, distance between, the two, between two countries uh, offers a good measure of uh, uh, trade. Uh, meaning, uh, uh, farther away countries uh, uh, controlling for their GDP, GDP levels, countries that are located far apart uh, trade far less, and countries that are closer to each other in distance trade a lot more. So, so distance turns out to be a very powerful explanation for bilateral trade, not total necessarily, but bilateral trade. So, what they do is use use this gravity model. Uh, which which uh, uh, uses distance as the determinant of trade. They estimate the part of the trade which is driven by the distance, bilateral distance between the countries. And then they say, look, you know, so this is clearly not, a, 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 and you're controlling for GDP. You're controlling for GDP. So therefore, this is tr this is the part of the trade which is not impacted by GDP. It is only impacted by bilateral distance. Now, then they run it, you know, that, that uh, if you take that part of the trade and see what impact it has on per capita uh, income growth, uh, per capita income, they find that, you know, countries that are on balance trading more have higher per capita incomes than countries that uh, are trading less. So this is a trade which is uncontaminated by uh, GDP uh, levels. Yeah. And, and, and so this is, you know, after that, of course, you know, now there is a long paper by uh, Doug Arwin, which does a survey of number of these, these studies that have been done, which try to, you know, uh, find different clever ways econometrically to get around the causation issue. And, and now there is plenty of evidence, actually, you know, so after my book came out, there is a lot of studies have come out, actually, which uh, basically point out to this fact that after, nine, you know, starting from mid 1990s, uh, you, you see very uh, substantial kind of uh, 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 increases in incomes of the countries that had opened up. And, and, and they are able to actually also establish the causation running from uh, uh, opening up and uh, expanding trade to uh, uh, GDP uh, 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 growth uh, or per capita GDP growth. So, so we have that evidence. No, and I personally find that evidence quite persuasive, especially the post-90s evidence after the collapse of the Soviet Union. As you point out, more and more countries are now embracing unilateral liberalization and opening up to free trade, which is, you know, the part of the transition economies in the Eastern Bloc, many developing countries. And overall, the questions people were asking changed, yeah. right? Earlier, this was up for a debate. And something that seems to have changed after the collapse of the Soviet Union is now, instead of debating the fundamental question of whether free trade and growth are linked to each other, we start thinking about what kinds of mechanisms, exactly how are they linked to each other, exactly what kind of growth takes place, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I want to dig deeper into the South Korean case. Uh, you know, one of the miracles of the 20th century, especially the second half of the 20th century, is South Korea. Of course, China is known better, the Chinese story, uh, both because of the size and scale, the enormity of the success, uh, but the reforms initiated by Deng Xiaoping uh, is, is pretty well known across the world and, you know, the, the impact that it's had on China. Uh, the South Korean miracle is 
I think very underrated and also under discussed and under recognized. And it comes in a different time period when this is not the prescription for most developing countries. Uh, so, you know, as, as you pointed out in the 1950s, South Korea is devastated by civil war. In today's terms, it, it would stand globally in the rankings of something like Syria or Yemen. Right. Modern day Syria and Yemen is sort of where South Korea is starting in the 1950s. Uh, about 10 percent of its GDP is coming from American aid. So it's really being propped up by aid and not as a as a trading economy. They have no real natural resources to speak of, no real you know, big agricultural output to speak of. And today, when you look at South Korea, the, the story is dramatically different. So one, of course, if you just do a simple ranking of countries by GDP per capita, South Korea is 35th across the world, right? It ranks higher than even some European countries in some years like Portugal. So that's one part of the success story. But on other terms, it's also a a, a big power in terms of, you know, uh, exporting what we call soft culture, cultural exports, right? So, you know, whether you're talking about Korean movies, uh, Korean, uh, you know, K-pop, you know, in popular culture, Korean fashion, cosmetics, Korea seems to have had a very different uh, you know, sort of impact on the world for a country of its size. So that's, you know, a second part. And during COVID, uh, we see that Korea seems to have managed and arrested the problem right from the beginning, right? They've had very unique solutions. And if there is a success story early on in COVID, not later on post-vaccinations, but very early on, I would say South Korea stands, you know, uh, as a highlight. So they've also improved their infrastructure, their state capacity, their social cooperation and cohesion and so on. So to me, it seems like South Korea is really the miracle story or like the breakout story, you know, in, in the 20th century. Uh, can you tell us one more just about what happened in South Korea? Because I think the story is relatively unknown. And then, you know, maybe we can delve into other parts of how the structural transformation took place in South Korea to sort of, you know, take it from what was, they, they used to call South Korea the global basket case, right? So so how did it go from that kind of a reputation to the reputation it has today? Yeah, no, very good. Uh, I, I think, you know, summarized it beautifully. I'll add, add, add two, <laughs> two additional uh, exports that are emerging from South Korea. Korean food is catching yes, on as it's well. it's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, 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 and you mentioned Korean movies, but Korean dramas. I mean, I'm a big fan myself of I Korean know. dramas. <laughs> uh, and uh, I should also mention that actually, finally, I found the Korean masks to be the best. <laughs> so the, the designing, you know, I mean, they really think about it. Uh, yeah. It's quite uh, so for for teaching my classes. Uh, I, I've been now using the Korean masks, and uh, you know because. For two hours, you are speaking uh, uh, with, with the mask on. And so you need the mask to be uh, uh, such that uh, nothing else comes in, but uh, but uh, at least air comes comes in, uh, uh, you know. So, I would actually uh, add to your list of shopping uh, Korean sunscreen for the summer when you're outdoors and mask free. I have found Korean sunscreen to be the best of any sunscreen that I have used. Uh, it's not sticky. It does the job really well. And uh, we can now get it in the United States. Yeah, and and you know we have recently started uh, 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 changing. You know, the, we've been in this apartment for about 16, 17 years, so changing all the appliances, and uh, all of these are LG. <laughs> they are <laughs> Korean, <laughs> and and you know, it, it's not just that they function well, but uh, but they they think of the consumer kind of conveniences. You know, exactly how to. Uh, I mean, small things. Uh, like you know, uh, what what uh, in in the cooking range? What should be the size of the burners, and you know what should be the distance between the burner itself and where the pot is going to sit? <laughs> All sorts of things. They pay attention to these these design issues, uh, uh, just as the, uh, I mentioned about the mask. You know, they they yeah. uh, 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 designing is very important in in almost any uh, uh, consumer uh, item. You know, we. Uh, I think of designing perhaps only on clothing, et cetera, <laughs> but, but uh, appliances also require proper designing. So anyway, uh, let's, let me get to, let me get to, to the uh, key issue that you have raised uh, on growth first, right? So, so it, it is good to at least get some 
perspective on the numbers first. Uh, at least the numbers that hopefully uh, you know the audience can also remember as we uh, go into go uh, go deeper. So 1954 to 62, right? So this is uh, so 54 is when uh, the the uh, Korean War ended uh, and and Korea began to rebuild. Uh, so 1954 to 62, the growth rate in Korea uh, annual growth rate. This is the GDP, not per capita, but GDP growth rate. Uh, is about 4.2%. So that's the eight year period and 4.2% and growth. Then a whole decade, 1963 to 73, Korea grew 9.1%. Now this was completely unprecedented as far as I know. Uh, well, in, there may have been Taiwan and Singapore and Hong Kong alongside happening, but, but so uh, rec recognizing that fact. Uh, this is, you know, completely unusual experience for uh, anybody. Uh, no country, you know, during the earlier uh, Western country, at least, you know, all the prosperous countries, none of them had ever grown at 9.1% in a single decade. So that was completely unprecedented. Then uh, we see some sort of uh, setback to growth. Uh, this is the period 74 to 82, another kind of eight-year period. 6.9%, 7 if you wish, but uh, clearly two percentage points below uh, what had been achieved in 63 to 73. Uh, and then uh, it resumes 1983 to 95, uh, uh, economy again grows about 8.7%. So that's another 12 year period, 8.7% fantastic growth. Now, you know, by this time, Korea is fully transformed. I mean, uh, it is no longer a poor country. Uh, uh, transformation is practically complete, uh, um, and, and we'll look at can look at some of the uh, actual changes that that happened uh, during this period. Poverty, of course, is pretty much you know at least uh, the way we think of poverty in Asia, uh, in, in China or India, the abject poverty uh, or extreme poverty that's pretty much gone uh, in Korea by 1995. You know, uh, per capita incomes have really grown quite quite a bit. Uh, we looked at some of the numbers on per capita income already. So, so that's the that's in a nutshell, you know, is 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 the growth story. Now, now let's look at you know what what happens to trade during this period, right? Now, trade. If you start out in in South Korea around 1960s um, till about 1965, mm -hmm. about five percent exports are five percent of the GDP, right? So they're about five percent of the GDP. By early 1970s, by early 1970s, 72, 73, somewhere there, it is already close to 30%, about 28% maybe, you know, so it's already about 28%. And by 1987, you've gone to 38% of the GDP. Now, what was 5%, you know, so, it's, so it's, trade is ex exploding during this period. Uh, 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 absolutely uh, phenomenal. Now, how, how is the transformation happening? Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, and China. So about th th those, those are the countries that, which have grown at this kind of pace of uh, 8 to 10 percent on a sustained basis for almost two to three decades, almost three decades. So uh, uh, the, this in each of these cases, uh, manufacturing is the first driver. Uh, it is the manufacturing growth that takes off. Yeah. And uh, uh, then as manufacturing grows, what happens is that it requires more and more workers. And, and in each of these cases, you see that the, uh, uh, the manufacturing that is growing very rapidly and that is also the operating in the export market uh, uh, is highly labor intensive. So it, it, it's it's uh, it's things like clothing, footwear, furniture. These kinds of products are what are being exported progressively more and more. Uh, 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 and, and and so it requires workers. Where do the workers come from? They draw them out of agriculture. Now these are also you know products which don't require a whole lot of time to train the workers. So if the farmers can come out. You know, in six to eight weeks they can. Korea also had a, had uh, was ahead of the uh, most of the countries in terms of the literacy. So so whereas on higher education they didn't do very well for a long time. You know, I mean, today of course they are well ahead of most other countries in the region. Uh, but uh, uh, on, on higher education they didn't spend much. But 
on primary uh, education and literacy, they were very big. Uh, in fact, in those days, anybody who acquired college education uh, was required by law to teach uh, in a primary school for five years, uh, including actually, you know, uh, President uh, Park Chung Hee. I mean, he's the kind of uh, uh, man behind the Korean miracle. Uh, even he had actually taught in, in school for five years uh, as a part of his uh, mandate. Uh, so he was an army general, of course, but but he had also done that. So 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 if you know, generally you've got five or six uh, uh, grade level primary education, uh, then workers can be trained into these labor intensive industries. Uh, that remains true today also. So that's how they they, they built up the workforce. Uh, and, and, and they operated in the global economy. So they, uh, they, these are good jobs that got created uh, and, and they kept drawing, kept drawing. Uh, 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 and so the share of manufacturing uh, began to rise uh, in the GDP. As these workers came in and, and at decent wages, they uh, uh, got employed, they spent their income. As they spend, of course, a lot of non-traded services because services tend to be non-traded, most of the services in those days, particularly, you know, uh, 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 so, so services also then begin to kick in uh, as as an engine. So, so, so there is this kind of uh, uh, connectedness between manufacturing growth and services growth. So, both of them they then begin to draw both services and manufacturing begin to draw workers out of agriculture. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that process happens. So, you know, the the share in GDP of agriculture, uh, which uh, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, around 1965, which was close to about 40%. Uh, by 1990, that dropped below 10%. So there's the share in GDP. Yeah. And, and manufacturing rose uh, during that period from about, you know, something like 13, 14% in 1960 to uh, uh, about 30% uh, in, in, in the uh, 1980s throughout. Um, and, and services, of course, uh, particularly after uh, 1975, services took off as well. So, so, you know, there's a sequencing that initially it's manufacturing that draws uh, 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 more workers, but then it becomes the services. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, workforce-wise, uh, uh, the, the story is even more dramatic. You know, about 1965, uh, about 60% uh, of the workers are in agriculture. This 1965, about 60% of the workers are in agriculture. By 1990, that figure drops to below 20%. Yeah. So there is 40 percentage points movement, you know, within 30 year uh, period. Yeah. So dramatic transformation uh, uh, in, in terms of the profession. And, and what is most remarkable is that during this entire period, wages, real wages have been growing on average nine to 10 percent. Uh, you know, you can one can look at uh, uh, different periods. Uh, for instance, you know, if you take 65 to 73, uh, wages grew 9.3%, 74 to 1982, they grew 9.6%, and then 1983 to 90, 10%. So, you know, it's, it's between 9 and 10% uh, 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 th throughout. So this is tremendous kind of boost to services demand, which have to be supplied locally, and that creates jobs and services as well. So, so it, it, it is quite remarkable. Now, one last part of the uh, transformation of South Korea. You take 1960s uh, 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 until about uh, uh, you know 1965 again, middle of uh, uh, 1960s. Uh, uh, it's about 30 percent urban. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, you know we are in India. Uh, if you look at 2011 census, urbanization is still only 31 percent. Uh, so so of course you know so Korea did start a little more urban than than India did uh, initially. Uh, India has been obviously much more rural, um, but look at what happens to the rate of urbanization as, as, uh, as this rapid growth happens. By 1990 uh, uh, already, uh, the urbanization was about 75%. It, it, it really kind of exploded. Uh, and, and it's not just, you know, that somehow the, all, all the rural uh, labor force kind of moved into urban areas. That was certainly part of the story, but it is also the fact that many of the rural areas turned urban. Yes. You see, I mean, this, this transformation always happens. I talk in terms of these types of, you know, there is a Mumbai-Shanghai model of urbanization, and then there is Shenzhen model of uh, urbanization. Yes. 
Mumbai Shanghai one is the one where cities already exist and more and more people come to these urban centers. That's the Mumbai Shanghai model. But the Shenzhen is different. Shenzhen, you go to 1980. This is in China. Yeah. Uh, 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 on the coast, you know, Shenzhen is, uh, was a f- uh, bunch of fishing villages. Uh, uh, maximally, the population was 300,000 yeah. uh, in 1980. And today, it is one of the most urbanized uh, spots, on the, uh, spots on the face of Earth. Um, yeah. it, it, it's incredibly urban. Very The entire kind of uh, uh, robotics industry, etc., is located in Shenzhen. Uh, and its population is something like 12, 13 million. Uh, some much larger, you know, from 300,000 to something like, you know, 12, 13 million. Uh, and per capita income is about $25,000 uh, uh, per year. Uh, it, it, it is rivaling Korea's pretty much, you know, uh, in Shenzhen itself. Uh, so so it, 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 this this urbanization was was the other kind of very, very important feature uh, of uh, uh, this, this transformation. So, so, you know, and, and the transformation of Korea is no different than of South uh, of Taiwan, for instance, or before that of Japan, or before that of if you go want to go back in history, United Kingdom, United States, uh, uh, Germany, etc. The big difference is that what what, what the earlier countries, the United States, UK, Germany, etc., took uh, over a hundred years. Yeah. Uh, South Korea compressed it all in thirty. I mean, they they really uh, got to where uh, uh, these countries took uh, hundred years to get to. They did it in thirty. That was the, the, the absolutely the, the, the big difference. And also, can you tell us one another aspect of structural transformation, which is initially South Korea starts out as a very low tech exporter, right? So they're really exporting garments, they're exporting hair. I remember you had mentioned is, is a big <laughs> part of the export industry. So there are uh, the, the composition of exports and imports has also changed over the years, right? Now imports are much more design-based, technology-based, innovation-based, whereas once upon a time, it was more someone else is innovating and now, chi- and you know, uh, South Korea is the cheap labor manufacturing hub, which can sort of, you know, uh, produce things at scale and, and, and sell them cheap. But that has also changed as Korea has gotten richer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so this uh, and and the whole idea here is and and this is where I think India can really learn a good bit, you know, that what we are doing is only we we try to to skill people only from the top. Uh, Now, because the Indian history or development has been different because it started with heavy industry and all. And so you did acquire some expertise in these very high tech industries. Uh, early in the game and and sort of you know that advantage translated eventually i would say between you know in the it industry software industry revolution and so forth but the whole point is that you still left most of your uh, 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 the large bulk of hundreds of millions of worker population completely untrained completely unskilled and, and, you know, you can't uh, train the population into this kind of very high level skill uh, uh, by bringing a farmer into IT industry or farmer into finance industry. You know, you, you can't do that. You, you really have to, you know, begin uh, at, at, at a level at which you can bring them in and, and be, give them certain training, uh, certain skills, impart them certain skills that they are able to absorb with their level of education and all. And then you build up and then you build up. And that's, you know, also in that process, right, in that process, during this process that I described, uh, South Korea did begin to become more and more capital abundant. Yeah, it's right. We talked about wages rising almost nine and a half, 10 percent a year. Yeah, that is referring to labor scarcity, right? Uh, uh, Cheap labor is no more available. Labor is, is becoming more and more scarce factor. Yeah. So you then can also shift into more capital intensive exports. Well, India wants to do it right away. And that is again the problem you see that, uh, that then your limited capital is being absorbed by, uh, uh, let's say, petroleum refining industry or some machinery industry or something, right? You know, then you deprive the other uh, labor intensive sectors of the capital. So, so there are these lessons to be drawn, uh, you know, uh, uh, from uh, uh, from South Korea that you know nobody immediately started off with these high tech exports. But Korea today, of course, is is fully transformed because you know its per capita income is close to about thirty thousand dollars, and at that level, 
evidently you, uh, you you can do much more and and so the workforce is also become more education more more educated and and you know you 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 got uh, uh, some world class universities that in in korea uh, now you know so in higher education they have caught up even though they didn't start you know uh, 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 so uh, uh, notwithstanding the advantage the, the disadvantage the language and all right we all kind of uh, ravel into this thing about what well, english is our language and we know english but uh, look at uh, uh, you know south korea had no english and, and and it could still develop and and uh, and become so influential and now even actually uh, uh, project is soft power right <laughs> in spite of the lack of english <laughs> it is able to project its soft power too so so it's it's quite quite interesting you know but but that all goes with wealth you see yeah. if you create wealth uh, uh, successfully then then uh, it, it can be done yeah and you know at so many points in our history when we read literature about how korea was talked about you know in the 60s and 70s and then china there is this pejorative first world commentary right oh these are people who just know how to make cheap t-shirts right that kind of a it's a very pejorative first world way of looking at the problem but now we realize that you know taiwan and south korea used to be the countries that made cheap t-shirts and then it got substituted by china then now even china is too rich to be making cheap t-shirts as cheaply as the world needs so now bangladesh is the new place that is making cheap t-shirts and if india doesn't catch up it's going to be some country in africa next right so so the uh-huh. idea so the idea is if you're cheap labor and you are competitive at it uh, the the irony is you are not going to be cheap labor for too long because you're going to get rich rather quickly and i think that is one of the underappreciated lessons uh, that there is no shortcut to the structural transformation uh, we can talk about this also in in the future episodes of our conversation on you know premature deindustrialization a lot of the the barriers to structural transformation for india and other developing countries but on south korea i you know before we wrap that story up i want to just uh, you know ask you the question about a lot of the commentary on south korea said that there was a success to south korea which can be attributed to industrial policy and not just to free trade so so far our conversation on south korea has been how free trade transformed the south korean you know miracle growth story how much of it can be contributed to industrial policy of south korea if at all uh, and is there any okay. merit in in those arguments yeah no I, I you see when when a success happens right when a success happens uh, uh, everybody thinks that it is their favorite theory that caused that success right and so and 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 they they managed to throw in enough to confuse the the wider audience uh, and and make it look like uh, you know it was uh, some sort of uh, uh um, fancy stuff that uh, they think countries ought to be doing and that's what korea did and that's how korea succeeded uh and industrial policy of course is is one of these favorite ones that that they throw in uh, uh you know so so they it, various terms get used sometimes as industrial policy sometimes they say that it was targeting right you know it's in, or industrial targeting uh, that is what led to the uh, success of korea so so the broad point first of all here Uh, to to understand is that uh, 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 you know con- governments always do something it's it's go- governments don't sit back uh, you know i mean in 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 this sense of when we say that invisible hand let it do the work and and the government should be completely hands off and all that is not what the governments do governments want to show that they are doing something and they are producing the success right uh, so so there is always these interventions that happen uh, 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 and then as i look you know they were doing all this intervention all these interventions and and uh, robert wade for example writes yeah. a whole thick book about taiwan you know uh, where he finds it. here here is this intervention is that intervention and all the real question is that you know can you connect the interventions to the success Uh, in the end you know you, you're you're saying that yeah we all agree that korea has grown rapidly in south korea and taiwan grew rapidly singapore grew rapidly and some interventions did happen 
but just because the interventions are happening does that mean that those interventions are the cause of the, the, the rapid growth or uh, is it the case that uh, those countries would have grown even more rapidly if uh, interventions were absent there was this big, very interesting exchange between Robert Wade and uh, uh, in separate papers, of course, they're, so they're not face to face. But uh, Ian Little, who was very yeah. much uh, at the forefront of advocating the outward orientation model. Uh, uh, and, and so Robert Wade kind of asked this question rhetorically, say, say, saying that, uh, that you know, uh, if you are going to argue that uh, in South Korea, interventions uh, uh, actually were uh, harmful to growth then you are saying that south korea would have been uh, would have grown even more rapidly uh, than it grew but it was already growing so rapidly that it is completely implausible that the absence of those interventions would have actually led to even faster growth so my story is more plausible because you know uh, 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 it grew that rapidly and and so uh, so, uh, so, so obviously, the, the, the interventions were making a positive contribution. Uh, this is sort of, you know, how is that an argument? But uh, Ian Little had a good uh, response to that. He said that, uh, why does Mr. Wade think that uh, Korea would not have grown even faster had there been no interventions? Uh, because Taiwan, in fact, did have less intervention, a lot less intervention than Korea did. And Taiwan did grow faster than <laughs> South Korea. <laughs> So, so that was one. But also, uh, 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 if we go back to, to, to the uh, growth rates that I had mentioned of, of, of South Korea, right? Uh, we, we have the, the, right, there is a full period from, say, rapid growth beginning in 1963 uh, to 1990s. So, so let's look at that, right? So 1963 to 1973, full decade. Korea grew 9.1%. Yeah. And this is, of course, the beginning of the miracle. It's the yeah. beginning of the miracle. Was that beginning of the miracle in any way connected to uh, uh, these industrial targeting? No. In fact, this is a period during which there is no industrial targeting. Yeah. Uh, the policies are all neutral. Products are left to them. You know, entrepreneurs are left to them to decide what they want to export. And uh, we have discussed this, this great example of human hair. Yeah. Uh, which nobody thought uh, could be an export item. Uh, and uh, if you look back at in 1962 or 61, there is no, you know, in the Korean export basket, there are no human hair. Yeah. And suddenly they begin to appear in, in mid, mid 1960s. And by 1972-73, they are 10% of the total Korean exports. Yeah. So, so there is there is no no uh, targeting happening during this period. Targeting starts in 1973, uh, and, and that's uh, you know. Uh, they, they, they were feeling some possible threat from uh, the United States that you know they might they might start imposing restrictions on Korean exports and things like that and and also I think U.S. was making some noises about withdrawing its part of its forces out of Korea and all so there was some fear that you know this military aid will also decline and all and so therefore you need to you know uh, ramp up your more capital intensive industry. So this is where the industrial targeting started, and it's called the you know uh, heavy industry and uh, uh, chemicals drive, uh, something like that. You know HCI, uh, heavy and chemical industry drive, HCI. Um, uh, and, and 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 certainly they intervene here. Uh, now, uh, side story, one side story to that, of course, is which Anne Kruger kind of tells very nicely you know, that some of the failures that happened simply don't get any mention, yes. uh, you know, because they, they disappear. So she refers to this ball bearing factory that they had uh, started in South Korea in, in, during this 1970s period, the uh, one of industrial targeting. It was a complete white elephant, you know, the, it was so costly that they couldn't compete in the export market. And in the domestic market, there was not enough demand. Yeah. So at the most, they could run it for two or three days out, out of the week. Uh, and eventually that factory that massive white elephant had to be closed down yeah with so a failure nobody kind of you know and some of the industries that were given this uh, 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 targeting business eventually did succeed but the question is that was it the intervention yeah if you look at the immediate impact of course of the intervention the period from 1974 to 82 your growth rate drops to 6.9 percent from 9.1 
it has dropped to 6.9%. So if I really correlate growth to uh, your period uh, of industrial targeting, you are certainly not doing that well. Yeah. Uh, there are also no studies that you know many of these industries that were targeted ex exhibited a lot lower productivity growth than the other industries which had not been targeted. Yeah. So there is some evidence there, there uh, uh, that evidence there as well. Uh, but but the but the fundamental point really is that you know when they say that oh you know uh, uh, you, you you targeted let's say auto industry or something and it became such a big success I mean the World Bank was arguing against uh, Korea doing auto industry and but they went ahead and did it anyway uh, but the question is it's a post hoc fallacy just because you 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 did it and then its success happened doesn't mean that you know because you intervened at that time and the success happened. Uh, I mean, eventually, South Korea was becoming more capital abundant. Yeah. And so this would have happened anyway. Maybe the industrial targeting kind of hazened it and brought it a little sooner. Uh, uh, but uh, certainly the success was not due to that. Gradually, Korea was becoming capital abundant and this transformation would have happened. And notice that once they, so this HCI drive is abandoned by late, by late 70s. But, you know, by 1980, more or less, they have abandoned it. Uh, 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 but but then look at the growth rate. Growth rate again from 1983 to 95, when you are back to liberalization and neutral policies, no targeting, then growth rate jumps back to 8.7 percent. So so where is the, the 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 success of industrial targeting other than post hoc fallacy? You know the, we call uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what is it called? Post hoc. Post hoc ergo, ergo propter hoc. Dr. Hawk, right? So, you know, after this, therefore, because of this. That is what's happening. I mean, there is a connection here just because, you know, interview, you intervene and some, eventually some industry succeeds. First of all, not every industry that you intervene succeeded. Actually, there's some major failures, as, as I mentioned about the ball bearing factory in South Korea. Uh, but, but the successes were because, you know, uh, uh, again, you talk of, of Japan, for instance, Ha Jun Cheng refers to all these, you know, uh, 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 the, the Japanese interventions in the mid 1930s, in let's say auto, on behalf of auto industry, or 1950s, and then 1980s Japanese cars become so successful. Yeah. So, oh look, you know, if the Korean government, if the Japanese government had not done it, then they, how does this follow? I mean, it could, it's entirely possible that the Japanese, that the car industry maybe uh, absent the Japanese uh, in, in the government intervention, maybe it would have disappeared. Yeah. But does it mean that uh, it would have never reappeared? <laughs> Once you become more cost effective, uh, your uh, capital becomes uh, cheaper still uh, because you are more capital abundant, uh, eventually the industry would come back out. I mean, it's not like... Uh, 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 so so th there is a lot of this post hoc fallacy uh, going on uh, in, in, in making these arguments. And I think, you know, just the broader point that you have always said, which is even if you can find individual success stories, right, in one case here, in one decade here, in one industry, in a particular country and so on, the question we're not asking is if someone picked the winners and losers correctly in one case. It's a question of sustained economic growth over, say, two, three, four decades, which leads Absolutely. to a particular kind of structural transformation. And on that, I think the evidence is quite, quite clear in favor of trade liberalization and against industrial policy, right? Even if they've had a handful of successes here and there, uh, which can be attributed to particular industries. I would actually go even one step further and say that, let's say even if there is merit in arguing that, you know, the Japanese government intervened and helped the car industry and then decades later, you know, Japan is, the, is one of the biggest leaders in car exports and so on. We also don't know the counterfactual of what else Japan may have done even better at than cars maybe had that not been propped up earlier. That's, you know, so both sides, even in the success stories, uh, it's very difficult to argue if resources went to their highest valued, most productive use, uh, 
in that particular instance, or maybe without the government nudging capital in a particular direction, that capital would have gone somewhere even better. And maybe Japan would have, you know, produced computers even cheaper, you know, two decades before instead of cars or something like that. Uh, and those things are very difficult to untangle. You know, we can just sort of make these arguments. Uh, but I think in terms of the two, three, four decade evidence that you provide, the, the South Korean story is, is just uh, extraordinary. Uh, yep. Since we're going to do a series of conversations uh, around this topic, uh, I have a number of other questions, you know, starting with industrial policy. I want to learn more from you about infant industry uh, and, you know, protectionist policies of that sort, which have taken place in various developing countries. Of course, uh, we need to talk about you know, the history of Indian trade policy, the history of Indian trade growth within the economy up to liberalization and after liberalization. And, you know, what is happening currently in India, which is sort of a U-turn uh, in one sense, you know, walking away from trade liberalization and so many other other themes that you've written about. Uh, so I think we can we can end the episode here. And uh, when you come back, we we'll talk about many more such themes. Thank you so much for doing this today, Arvind. Thank you, Shruti. Great pleasure. Great pleasure. Great conversation.